Hang on. Okay. Oh. We're going to just start this quickly again. We're looking at the final question on the G3B paper. This is after you've done your whatever number of minutes it's been on globalisation and climatic hazards. That paper is taken in. You're given a new exam paper out, and I believe you have one hour to answer it. Okay, minutes. all about, 45 minutes, sorry, all about investigation techniques as well as the meander trip that you went on to Miskin. Okay, some of you might get this, uh, might think I haven't been on a trip to a meander, but let's just imagine that we have. Um, we went to Miskin, the area itself no, um, shows the River Ely, it is outside Lantricent. We've set our question, which is looking at the landforms of a river. And the landform we're looking at is a meander. We've looked at Google Earth to work out where is there a decent meander local to Whitchurch High School. And you decided, because it was your trip, that you would go west to Flantricent. Um, it's accessible. It, you didn't have to break laws or rules or fences to get there. It is on a, a public pathway along the river. It is quite close to a residential area, I must admit which might impact its um, lag time. In other words, the water running down that surface, because it's concrete and so on, it might actually get to the river quickly. So bear in mind that is, that is obviously a factor. But anyway, we've made our, our way to the river, and the things that we're going to record there, the basics are, of course, the width of the channel, first of all. We've also set our group up into three different groups. If I show you, and I'll... I'll tweet this image of a, a beautiful image of a meander. Um, we gave three groups, three parts of the river to look at. So group A, we're looking there. Group B, look there. And then group C, we're looking here. All right? So everybody is able to study a meander in quite a lot of detail. Um, I've added some bearings across the channel. In other words... The bearing readings gave you how sinuous it was. In other words, how bendy it was. But the other things that you looked at were width. That's basically measured in metres. We looked at the depth of the river. But we did that not just in the middle, but we looked at the width. We divided it by 10, and that gave us 11 measuring points which we did using just a metre rule. So that was measured in centimetres. Okay. We also looked, and maybe you can tell me, what else did you look at? Velocity. Velocity. How did you measure velocity? Flow metre. Using the flow metre. Now, you didn't use a cork and a stopwatch, no. which is what you did at GCSE level. So how have, you, how have you improved this data collection? More accurate. It's more accurate. So you used a flow metre which gave you metres per second. Where did you do the flow metre readings, though? At Just once? Depth interval. So at each of the depth intervals... And then down five centimetres. And, and every five centimetres in depth, you end up with a very, very detailed network of results. Yeah, I was looking in here, and um, it says, like, in the intro, they did it to, until they got to the, um, the bed. That's right. But they didn't, like, I don't get They, they... Did they just do When they drew the, the isovel lines, which we'll talk about with data presentation, um, they basically, it looks like they didn't do a reading, but they did, it's just that that area didn't okay. show a great variety of velocity. I don't know, I don't think... So, I mean, so that was every five centimetres in depth... Because I stopped there at like at 25, 30. But so the, they the depths are like 60, so. No, that's the width across the river. No, the uh, depth at each point. Okay. Can I have a quick look at that? Because I was actually on this trip. I was on this trip. <laughs> I have photographs to prove it. Um, and I know the idea was that we did actually do depth readings and sort of, sorry, velocity readings every five centimetres down from the surface of the water. Um, they should have gone to the, as you say, until it hit rock bottom, basically. 
or five centimeters above it, perhaps. Um, as to why they didn't, I say can't say. Though, you can say that you did it. So you've got a full set of results across. I'm not sure. What I'm going to do for you is I'm, I'm drawing that, that very simple cross section. And what we can say from this, once they've got depth readings, they've got velocity, they've got width, they've also done bed load. And that's not just the shape but also the size. And they were able to see that um, we did have an area of fastest flow. They created what's called an isovel diagram, which basically is a bit like a contour map of the cross section. And they were able to see where the fastest flow was found. Now, much as theory would tell us, the fastest flow is where you're furthest from friction, in other words, the sides of the bank. And the slowest flow is where there was most friction, in other words, the sides of the bank, because the water is literally using its energy to get around these obstacles, in other words, pebbles. Okay? The very top of the river was also slowed down by air, in other words, air friction, actually acting on the surface of the water. So this is our area of fastest flow. Um, no big surprise, it was closer to the river cliff than it was to the slip-off slope. Because that, again, using your hydrology theory from G1, is the area where you've got most velocity, most erosion. Can you tell me, what was the bed load like? Did you see any change in bed load across your meander? Negative correlation. In other words, the size increased or decreased as velocity increased. increased. Okay. So in other words, the velocity is having an effect on the bed load. It's eroding it into smaller particles. That makes sense, doesn't it? So we've got our, our larger bed load on the slip-off slope side. It's also more angular, whereas you've got the smaller bed load on the river cliff side because it's been so impacted by the erosive power of the water. Again, we're not, we're not twisting any of your geographical theory here. You know this from year 10. All right? But you've actually now looked at a landform yourself. You understand that it does show a pattern of velocity. It does show a pattern of bed load size and shape. And that is all to do with the energy of the water as it moves around the meander. So as it does move, where is the fastest flow in a meander? The outside of the bend. What's that caused by? Centrifugal forces. So much like if you were swinging a, a skipping rope around your head, the, the greatest energy is at the very end of it because it has to actually travel down around a greater distance. So anyway, we've got a greater amount of erosion on the outside of the bend. We've got a greater amount of velocity, but we've got our smaller bed load. That's our river cliff. Okay? So that's where it's bumping and grinding into the side of the river. But where we have the opposite, in other words, the inside of the bank, we actually have deposition in what we then call the slip-off slope. Some people call these a river bar. It's the same thing. Point bar, Point bar sorry and you're going to have deposition happening there, all right? But that's what gives it this iconic shape. You've got your point bar or slip off slope there and your river cliff here with all the erosion happening. All right? So what else do we need to know? You, you're going to be asked, we're going to quickly, I've just given you an overview. Let's quickly look at the questions that they've asked about this in the past. Therefore, we're going to be hopefully prepared for what they're going to ask tomorrow. I was going to say the future, but it's nearly the present, although it may not feel like much of a gift. That was poetic, I thought. Have I, I think we shared the copy of questions. Did we just take it a minute ago? Did I show you the questions? Yeah, I've got it here, Miles. Oh, say, 
the questions then. Um, obviously, it's at this point of the exam you have no choice. You have to do everything in front of you. Um, it is worth this entire 45 minutes will get you 25 marks. Okay, so basically you're going to spend nearly twice, sort of two minutes per mark. So this first question is about investigations. So use about 15 minutes to do it. And your final question is on the, the trip itself. And this, you should really give a, a good half hour to, to get all of those points, okay? So this, I've always said a point a minute, but this time it's two points a minute-ish. Um, so last year's question, can I just say, like you this year, they were given a specific type of geography to look at. You this year have been asked to look at landforms, whereas last year, in fact, they were also looking at landforms. But let's, so let's look at their question. It said, summarise the findings of your personal research into landforms and river valleys and critically examine your methods of data presentation. Now you'll notice those marks therefore, they don't just want you to look at data presentation, they want you to look, they want, to, you want you to tell the examiner what were your main conclusions, what did you find out from your study of landforms, in other words meanders. Okay, are you able to do that with confidence? Explain what you found out. So then the other part of the question is, examine your, critically examine. So they want you to rip this apart a bit. Tell me what was good and what was bad about your data presentation. So from your ISOVEL diagram, how is that good or bad? It's good. How is it good? I agree, I think it is Eas good. Easily shows where the fastest flow of the river is. It's very easy to inter uh, to inter interpret it as to where the fastest flow is, yes? Um, you could easily compare it to another one at like point 0.2 or point 0.3, could you use the same scale? Yeah, if you use the same scale, it's very easy to, to look at differences or similarities between other parts of the river. How else is an isovel diagram good? Um, it like shows you where it's because the mm -hmm. it's not just showing you velocity but it's also showing you shape so you can therefore link that into maybe why it's a slower velocity or a faster velocity because you, you're making the link between well it's far away from friction so we do like these, it's very visual geographers like something visual it shows the shape of the slope very, very quickly, very easily anybody can interpret this okay it doesn't take a degree in geography to understand what it's telling you. All right? What's bad about it? Because you were asked to critically. So tell me what's what's poor about it. What's what could be better? Do you sometimes have to guess the shape of the ice valve because you don't know for sure? Mm. You just link the map, yeah. like you just join the map. Yes, it's a bit like a contour map. Um, or any kind of mapping, you have not done every single centimetre of depth of water. You've the done boundaries. every five. The boundaries don't change uh, like that, you know. Consistently. Yeah. I think the, the big thing is, though, that you are, there are areas where you know you haven't sampled and therefore you're assuming that it's going to be, like if you've got three different depths, a depth of five, seven and ten you're assuming that what was at seven is the same as five or ten so your sampling technique although it's good it's not perfect there are going to be gaps so there is a certain amount of assumption made here that the area between sampling intervals is the same it probably is let's face it we're not dealing with an unpredictable teenager but we are dealing with a river which has got predictable forces of nature at work Okay, that's not the only type of data presentation you've used. You have done scatter graphs, so could you tell me, because we were told by Miles there that bed load size showed a negative correlation. In other words, you're going to be looking at something like that, which is a very poorly drawn scatter graph. I'm sorry about that. But basically, as we saw the velocity increase, we saw the size of the bed load decrease. Now, why are, first of all, why are scatter graphs a good way of showing data? 